Hello and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know, a podcast about classical education, the ancient world, and whatever else we hosts feel like talking about. My name is Thomas Magby, and if you are a longtime listener, or even anytime listener, you probably know that I am normally joined by two other co-hosts, AJ Hannenberg and Graham Donaldson. Unfortunately, due to the coronavirus, uh, unfortunately due to shelter-in-place restrictions, we are not able to meet together in person, but I wanted to go ahead and put together an episode and record it and send it out to you all. We've seen a couple emails and podcast reviews and things like that asking if we are okay, and yes, everyone is fine. No one is sick. Everyone is doing well. So I will go ahead and dive into this. Just as a brief preface, I am continuing on with what I had previously been discussing before the virus, which was Dante's Purgatory. If you would like to go back and listen, AJ had a a series on the Decameron that he was doing by himself during Shelter in Place as well. So I recommend it to you. It is very good. And with that, I will dive into my episode. As a preface to all of this, I need to say that I have been thinking recently a lot about the coronavirus, and I assume that's the same for everyone listening to this right now. But I've been especially wondering about the coronavirus and the impact of everything being on pause for an extended an, an extended period of time. And also, just so I say it, we're not a show about current events, so most of what I have to say is about classical works, namely the Purgatorio, and principles from those works that we can apply to our daily lives, as opposed to commentary on anything happening right now. That's not really what we do here. And as a final preface, I have used and will continue to use the words shelter in place, self-quarantine, and more interchangeably. By all of those phrases, I mean any mandate to work from home or to avoid public places. I don't know where I first heard this question, but for the duration of shelter in place, I have wondered, will we leave this quarantine better than when we entered it? I'm sure hearing that question, you either have an immediate reaction of yes or no. But I want to frame this in a particular way. Depending on what you read, habits take 21 or 28 or 66 or 128 days to form. As of recording this, the city of Austin has been under some form of self-quarantine for about 80 days. I worry about what practices or attitudes or generally habits that I will leave this lockdown with when we eventually do leave this lockdown. With that said, I think the Purgatorio is the perfect book for these times. I know I've been challenged by what I've read through so far, and I hope some of the lessons that I've learned are helpful for you too. Okay, so let's reorient ourselves to where we are. At this point in the story, we have followed Dante through hell in the Inferno, We've watched him arrive in Purgatory, and we have seen him progress through the areas just outside of Mount Purgatory itself. For more information on this, you can check out episode 123, which is helpfully titled Purgatorio. At the start of this point in the story, we find Dante still a ways off from the entrance to Purgatory. And if you listened to our episodes on the Inferno, you know there's one thing that Dante loves to do at points of dramatic tension. Sleep. So Dante falls asleep, and he dreams. In his dreams, he sees a giant eagle flying around, and Dante admires this eagle. And in perhaps the strangest use of Chekhov's gun, maybe it's a Chekhov's bird, this eagle swoops down, grabs Dante, and lifts him into the sky. Clearly, this is, this is a very large eagle. The eagle lifts Dante further and further into the sky, directly toward a set of rings on fire. Closer and closer they draw until they are consumed by this fire. They're burned up, and suddenly Dante wakes up. While the scene seemed real to Dante and seemed real to us, we are reminded it was just a dream. This dream ends with Dante awakening to see Virgil and realizing that he is not in the same place where he fell asleep. Virgil tells Dante that, while he slept, he had been brought right to the gates of purgatory by the gentle lady Lucy, or Lucia in the original Italian. While not mentioned here, This is in fact the same uh, St. Lucy, Santa Lucia, whom back in the Inferno was commanded by St. Mary to go to Beatrice, to go to Dante, to kick off this whole crazy adventure of the Inferno, Purgatorio, and eventually Paradiso. In an ancient episode on Acedia, we talked about how love pulls us out of ourselves and towards some external object of love, a romantic partner, a friend, or some material thing that we want, like a house, a car, a boat. The attraction requires motion towards the object, 
And if we are successful, we achieve union with that object, uh, marriage or a close friendship or buying whatever thing it is that we desired in the first place. I worry that in the fallout from coronavirus, we are losing the vision of an object to strive for. With 40 million people unemployed, what's the point of looking for work? With a quarter of a million businesses filing for bankruptcy in the, in the United States in 2020, that's just since January, what's the point of striking out on your own to accomplish something new? With shelter in place and mask wearing in effect, how are we to date or spend time with friends? With businesses only running at limited capacity, what's the point of working for that car or house or boat that seemed so appealing before but that you can't even buy now? Dante, in his dream, is given an image of what he's headed toward, the all-consuming fire of God, and a reminder that he is not in charge of this journey. He is brought to the fire in his dream by an eagle, and he's brought to Purgatory's gates by St. Lucy. We need both of these things. We need something to direct our efforts toward, and we need people around us to help us to get there. Dante's contribution to where he has gotten is minimal. He has been guided safely by Virgil, and before that, given direction by Beatrice, the eagle dream shows us that even beyond these characters, Dante has been brought this far by God. This is from Isaiah. They that hope in the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall take wings as eagles. In the same way, we do not make progress on our own. We are pulled beyond ourselves toward some object by love, which seems to create a gravity which we cannot escape. And we will only get closer with the help of others, either the object of love themselves or co-workers, or family members, or friends. Our growth is only possible with much help. So, with that, Dante approaches the entrance to Purgatory, the gates of Purgatory. He sees three giant steps before him, and a guardian sitting on a throne at the top of the third step. This guardian is so bright that Dante cannot look directly at him. The three steps end up getting more description than the guardian, so they bear some examination. The first stone is white marble, in which Dante saw himself as in glass. The second is darker than violet brown. It's scorched, it's cracked, it's, it, it looks broken. And the third is a red as blood porphyry, which is an igneous rock that has crystals, so, um, so something like quartz dispersed through a solid colored portion, in this case red. So imagine solid blood red with these crystals dispersed uh, throughout the step. And I know that describing unfamiliar rocks isn't exactly peak podcast material, so I recommend Googling this one just to see what it looks like. Uh, you will also see that it's often associated with royalty or someone who's wealthy. Um, this color and this material that um, houses or steps would be built out of this for well-off people historically. So though again, the, the main point here is that the third step is solid, it's complete, as opposed to the chipped and broken second step. These three steps are our model for ascending, or in the metaphor at use, climbing the steps of purgatory. We must first look and see ourselves as we really are, which is the marble step. If we don't see a problem, there's no reason for putting in the work to improve. Seeing clearly shows us the ugliness which is present, leading us to the second step, which is the eyesore of the three. This middle step is the realization of the ugliness of the problem in ourselves that we are trying to fix. We have to be disgusted that something wicked like that is inside of us. But we don't stay on this middle step. We are meant to move to a restored third step. The translator of this version of the purgatory, Anthony, uh, Professor Anthony Esselin, takes this third step to be a sign of the passion of the penitent, the passion, the ardor, the spirit of the penitent uh, moving toward atoning for his wrong, atoning for his sin. The person looking to overcome sin doesn't end in the removal of passion, uh, which is this stoic ideal of apatheia. But the, the goal is to move toward a redirected, a renewed new passion. So which step are you in? If you're like me, shelter in place has shown you all of the things you've lied to yourself about not having enough time for. Time was just an excuse for all of the things I didn't want to take the effort to do in the first place. That shows me lacking the first step. I've not seen the problems in myself, or I've not rightly seen um, that what I call personality or individual difference is actually some sin or brokenness that needs to be conquered in me. Or maybe you're stuck on the second step. You see your problems, but you are stuck on how disgusting and broken your sin is, or how broken you are, or how imperfect the world is around you. And for what it's worth, this is an important step. 
but it's just not the ultimate step. If we are stuck here, there are, there are only problems in me. Uh, there are only problems in those around me. There are, are only problems in the world. Uh, saying that there are only problems uh, leads to despair. There's no opportunity or possibility of things improving or being better. So we must move to the final restored step. Here, reflecting on the concept of walking a staircase is helpful. There's clearly a problem with staying on the first two steps of a giant staircase, but there's also a problem with always staying on the staircase and never reaching the second floor. The restoration we desire is possible and will eventually be achieved. According to Dante, all of those in, pur in purgatory will eventually be purged and will eventually enter heaven. Dante will eventually see this restoration in paradise, but just because perfection is on the other side of death doesn't mean improvement is impossible. In the same way that some are more condemned in the inferno than others, some start out higher up in the purgatory or move more easily through the, the steps than others. Think of the slothful repentance who we met in episode 123. Their laziness on earth followed them into the afterlife. And so all of as an aside to an aside, it has recently struck me that Dante's Inferno and Purgatory are filled with individuals. While Dante saw significant problems in the Catholic Church, it's the still living, at the time the Inferno was written, it's the still living Pope Boniface VIII who's condemned to the Inferno, not the Church itself. And perhaps this is because the Church wasn't in any sense dead. But in some sense, in some sense there's no way for the Church to atone for its sins. The sins reside in the individual, and that's where the atonement resides and is necessitated as well. It seems then that the direction of improvement is from individuals to institutions. In the same way that the discussion of the ideal form of government in Plato's Republic, which AJ has been describing in, a, in an excellent ongoing series on Plato's Republic, um, the ideal form of government is centered around finding ways to put into power the best of us. Uh, perhaps the way to, in the same way that the ideal form of government is to find ways to put the best of us into power, perhaps the best way to a better family or to a better company or to a better society is through our own improvement, is through the improvement of individuals. A part of my work at Veritas is to lead our student congress, which is a body of student leaders in the high school. I have previously posed the question to them, what is the most significant problem at our school? And dozens of answers come back, many of them the same ones I would have given in high school as well. There's too much homework, uh, classes move too quickly, uh, the dress code is too strict, the cell phone policy is draconian. And honestly, they often have uh, valid problems that they point to, valid concerns that they point to. But I think the only answer that doesn't guarantee frustration is to say, the most significant problem at the school is me. I am in need of seeing my problems clearly. I am in need of being disgusted by my problems. I am in need of doing the work to address my problems. It is my job to fix my problems and use whatever influence and power I have for the good and thriving of those around me. So with all of that said, the ultimate point of this section is to get Dante to the gates of purgatory, where the guardian marks him with the letter P seven times upon his forehead and bids Dante wash these wounds away. The letter P stands for peccati, which is the Italian word for sin. My word processor is trying to auto-change this word to peccari, but no, I do in fact mean peccati. This is, again, the Italian word for sin. Washing away these seven sins will be the work of the next 20-odd county. With all of this done, the guardian opens the gate of purgatory and bids Dante to enter. Dante does so as he hears the words to we praise thee God rising up around him. All right, that has gotten us through the gates of purgatory, and we'll continue at some point in the future with uh, the actual levels of purgatory itself. I make no promises as to how often these episodes will come out, but I hope you enjoyed this. If you have any questions or comments, you can email us at theguys at classicalstuff.net. You can find us online at classicalstuff.net or on Twitter. We're at classicalstuff, C-L-S-S-C-A-L stuff. I hope you all are doing well and hanging in there, and I look forward to talking with you all again soon. Take care.